extremes of deadly weather. He was struck by lightning, battered by hailstones, pitched into freezing seas, or washed away by flash floods. Just how do you survive? Four people got hit that day, three died. I still do not know why I was the lucky one. How much can we take of the extremes of heat or of cold? Human beings are tough but fragile. Once we pass certain limits, we die easily. Naked science learns what it takes to survive nature's fury. show host Louise Brady volunteers for grueling body shock demonstrations to show how our bodies protect us from forces of nature. 850 kilovolts of simulated light is at her car. Extreme survival expert Dr. Kenneth Kemmler guides us throughout the program. People die in extreme weather conditions because the outside environment becomes too much for the body to handle. Dr. Kamler has studied how human beings survive the very worst the environment can throw at them. We do have natural defense mechanisms which protect us from the outside environment, but these can be overwhelmed by extreme weather. Extreme weather such as severe thunderstorms and lightning. One of the things against which we have no natural defense mechanisms. It can strike any time, anywhere. August 20th, 1985, Memorial Park, Houston, Texas. Oceanographer Dana Larson jogs through the park on this typical summer afternoon. Storms brew in the distance, but Larson thinks little of it. Suddenly, victim of a terrifying and random act of fate, he crashes to the ground. Like several others that day, he's been struck by a bolt of lightning. I don't remember anything about being hit. I wish I did, because I think that that would have been a very memorable experience. Larson lies unconscious and unmoving until passers-by summon emergency services who rush him to the hospital. Doctors rapidly establish that Larson has few outwardly obvious physical injuries. One deeply disturbing effect of the lightning strike becomes apparent. The strike has damaged his short-term memory. And he said, Mr. Larson, have we ever met before? And I said... Dude, I don't think so. And then he said, Mr. Larson, would you look at the wall? And I did, and he said, Mr. Larson, would you look at me again? I looked back at him, and he said, Mr. Larson, have we ever met before? And I looked at him again, and I said, dude, I don't think so. Larson is one of the roughly 300 people injured by lightning in the U.S. Lightning expert Ron Hawley from Tucson, Arizona, has studied the phenomenon for 20 years. This lightning comes down from the sky, it looks for something to hit that's the most uh, convenient or closest to it coming, looking down from above. And when something is tall, that's the first thing that's going to be struck. It doesn't hit the ground if there's something tall around. If there's nothing in terms of a tree or another object nearby, then it will hit a person standing in the open. Holly's research shows that if you're standing outside the lightning storm, then you're in serious danger. There really is nowhere safe outside from lightning. Um, a lot of myths are held with regard to what you're holding or carrying or wearing. It doesn't matter. If you're the tallest object, especially if you're in the open, you are the object that the lightning will come down and reach. Strangely, many victims are not struck from above. I think about half of all lightning deaths and injuries occurred to people where the current comes up from the ground. It comes up through the feet. That's why it's very common to hear of people uh, having their shoes blown off or they're thrown off their feet. 
Dr. Larson, the lightning strike has other horrific effects. He suffers nerve damage and experiences headaches that drive him to despair. The headache would come. I thought seriously about committing suicide. Um, gradually, they went away. If they had not gone away, I would have committed suicide. Now that the headaches have gone, Larson considers himself fortunate. In the United States alone, an average of 60 people die each year as a result of lightning strikes. I felt very lucky in that three, four people got hit that day, three died. I still do not know why I was the lucky one. But despite his recovery, Larson has developed a dangerous obsession. He feels compelled to go out to watch any storm within reach. Fascinated by it. It's so beautiful, so powerful. I still would like to be close to lightning. It's so beautiful. The deadly danger and utter unpredictability of lightning strikes make them tough to study. But scientists at a research facility in Germany are overcoming that problem. They've made a machine that creates artificial lightning. Even better, their test thunderbolts will strike exactly when and where they want. Our somewhat nervous body shock volunteer, Louise Brady, will discover firsthand what it feels like to be directly under a lightning strike. Okay. Yeah. It's clearly too dangerous to zap an exposed human being with artificial lightning, so she sits in a car. The scientists create a charge of 850 kilovolts using a series of giant transformers. That's enough power to arc from the generator to the car roof. It's also important that Louise sits on her hands. She's warned that touching anything connected to the metal body could divert the electric charge onto her with potentially catastrophic results. I've been told I won't feel a thing. Luckily for Louise, the demonstration appears to be going to plan. The bolts of lightning flash through the metal roof and arc to the ground. Louise is safe. The metal body conducts electricity more efficiently than anything else on the car, so the charge bypasses her as it finds the shortest route to the ground. Okay, I can't feel anything. I can't feel anything. I mean, I can. I can feel me. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Louise senses the electric charge in the air, but feels none of the effects of a lightning strike. But what if it all went wrong? What would happen to her if she was struck by lightning? As lightning strikes a person, it seeks out the most efficient conductor through the body. That's the central nervous system, a pathway ready designed for conducting electrical nerve signals. The human body is an almost unimaginable collection of chemical reactions and electrical circuits. When someone is struck by lightning, they suddenly get overwhelmed by a tremendous force of electricity. And it's as if the body is short-circuited. All these systems go haywire. If the charge passes through the body without affecting the major organs, then the person has a good chance of surviving. But the effects can be deadly if it hits the heart. The shock can throw the heart out of its normal rhythm, so it can't pump blood around the body. It might even stop completely. In both cases, the victim faces death. Most victims of lightning are struck in the open air. But where lightning is concerned, there are no rules to guarantee that you're safe. September 4, 2001, Cordell, Oklahoma. 15-year-old Justin Norris works his shift in a fast food restaurant. Outside, a thunderstorm brews. Since he's working inside, Norris doesn't think anything of it and touches the intercom on the drive through counter at the instant lightning strikes. And I reached up to turn up the volume knob with my right hand, and uh, lightning hit the menu board outside. Uh, wasn't grounded right, and it surged through the wires into me and dropped me on the spot. An immense electrical charge hurls Justin to the ground. They told me, though, uh, while I was seizuring for the two and a half hours that that was the electricity trying to make its way out of my body. There was at least eight to ten hours that was uncounted for that I just, I don't remember anything about. 
Norris survives, but with damage to his brain's frontal lobe, a region of the brain believed to be involved with memory. It's left a lot of, a lot of memory loss, short term. I had to learn my left and my right again. Uh, had a hard time remembering names, faces, phone numbers. Very fatigued, very tired all the time. Could have easily taken my life other than gave it back, you know? And, uh, I mean, you just don't take, don't take everything for granted. Live each day to the fullest. Norris now avoids lightning at all costs. You know, if the lightning storm comes up, then I'm, I'm pretty much going to be indoors and away from everything electronically, you know. Both Norris and Larson had their lives changed in an instant. But some weather extremes take hours, even days, to kill or injure you. One of the most deadly extremes is heat. So far, we've looked at the deadly impact of lightning that can kill individuals in an instant. Now we turn to a weather extreme that takes longer, but that can kill hundreds. 1995, a heat wave in Chicago, Illinois. Temperatures soared to over 100, with a heat index peaking at 120. Many people suffer from heat exhaustion. More than 700 lose their lives. The problem with extreme heat is that human beings can only survive within a relatively narrow band of temperatures. If we didn't have such elaborate defense mechanisms to protect us from outside heat, we'd be no different than a piece of meat in an oven. So how can our bodies protect themselves in the hottest of conditions? We subject our volunteer, Louise Brady, to another brutal body shock demonstration, extreme heat. The demonstration is overseen by Kinetic, a defense research facility studying the effect of extreme conditions on battlefield troops. Louise is going to spend 45 minutes in a heat chamber set at 115 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about the average summer temperature in Death Valley, California. Before entering the chamber, Louise swallows a tiny radio transmitter that will record her internal core temperature throughout the experiment. Her initial core temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So the core temperature is 37.47 now. An infrared image of her body shows her surface temperature. Blue is cold, red is hot. Louise walks on a treadmill to simulate walking through the desert. Even though she is a fit and active young woman, she finds the 115 degrees heat hard to cope with. For Louise to survive in extreme heat, she needs to keep her internal organs, such as her heart, liver, and brain, cool, so they can continue to work efficiently. To do this, her body activates a series of cooling mechanisms. It increases blood flow to the surface, carrying more heat away from the core to the skin. That heat is lost by radiation and convection to the air, in much the same way a car radiator dissipates heat from the car engine. This system is very efficient until the outside temperature gets too high. If the outside temperature is higher than your body temperature, then you won't lose heat at all. In fact, you'll gain heat. So in those situations, the body resorts to its backup mechanism to relieve uh, excess heat. That backup mechanism is sweating. Louise's pores release water onto her skin. Evaporation draws heat energy from her skin and cools blood near the surface. Circulating through her body, it cools her vital organs. I'm slumping forward. I'm sweating a lot. It's running down my back. I'm losing a bit of balance, actually. I'm losing my sense of balance as well. That's weird. But there is a downside to sweating. It costs Louise water and can lead to dehydration. As she becomes dehydrated, the delicate fluid salt balance is upset. In extreme cases, that can lead to organ failure. The body is such a fine-tuned mechanism that it can't tolerate having the wrong proportion of salt in its system. 
And once that occurs, it starts a downward spiral, which will be fatal. Louise was in the 115 degree heat chamber for 45 minutes. The infrared camera shows how her body surface has reacted. On the left is before the test, on the right, after. The images show a dramatic increase in surface temperature. I feel absolutely exhausted. Um, so hot inside. I, I can't tell you, I feel like I'm boiling up. While her surface temperature has soared to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Louise's cooling mechanisms are working well, and her core temperature has only gone up by half a degree, a rise that will not cause any significant damage. But Louise's body has paid a high price. She lost more than half a pint of fluid through perspiration. is the most significant factor in whether or not we can survive extreme heat. Most people don't die from the high temperatures. They die from dehydration. Walter Berkby, a forensic anthropologist from Arizona, explains that if Louise had been stuck outside in such high temperatures without water, she could have died. When you start losing water, you begin to dehydrate. And when you dehydrate, uh, the body system begins to malfunction. You're not thinking as clearly as you used to. The uh, tissues are screaming for water. The heart pumps harder. Uh, things just go to pot. As people get hotter, they do anything to cool down. You start taking off your clothing. Dumb thing to do because that just increases the dehydration. Eventually, you will get to the point where you start hallucinating and you, you wander around in circles uh, you're lost once the individual's mind starts to go the end is near when they start that dementia that occurs with dehydration because of a lack of fluid then uh, you go down you'll just walk until you drop when you drop that's it. You're not dead, but you will be very short. It's a slow death. It's a terrible death. That terrible death of heat exhaustion does happen in places where the conditions are severe. But there's no need to travel to extreme places to be killed by the weather. Nature's fury can harm us inside our own homes and communities. Individuals can die from lightning strikes and the terrors of dehydration death from extreme heat in the deserts of Earth. Yet there is one weather phenomenon that brings death and destruction to our own homes. The tornado. Tornadoes can strike in the middle of a hot summer's day with little or no warning, but with catastrophic results. Generating winds of up to around 300 miles an hour they can transform almost anything into an instrument of death. Appearing within seconds, catching people and communities utterly unaware, bringing almost unimaginable devastation. And that is just what happened when a tornado smashes its way through Oklahoma on a spring day in May 1999. There really is no home straight down there. It's just debris from the neighborhood before. Hundreds and hundreds of homes are completely gone. Hundreds of yards wide, a tornado races north through Oklahoma, smashing into the tiny community of Bridge Creek. Baptist minister Tom Duckett watches the storm as it hits. It was the most powerful um, a wind movement I've ever seen. It was the widest path of anything that I've ever watched or been close to. It just was huge. It blotted out the sky, it moved the earth that you were standing on, it rumbled as tornadoes do, it screamed. The 300 mile an hour winds pick up massive pieces of debris. Some of those things were 40 and 50 foot long, it was sides of houses, it was trailers. And I knew by the time I'd been that close to the storm, even though my family was packed away, that if it got to us, 
there was nothing in the world I could do. Uh, it was just, it was monstrous. At this point, you can see the tornado is going almost due north on the ground, creating total destruction at least five blocks wide. Much of the damage during a tornado is caused by debris snatched up by the wind and hurled at sometimes hundreds of miles an hour. To assess what damage such missiles can cause, we return to the Defense Research Facility, Kinetic, to meet Dr. Roger White. A giant compressed gas gun demonstrates how tornado strength winds can turn any object into a dangerous projectile. Just to prove how dangerous any object can be at F5 tornado speeds, we're going to launch this jelly bean down the gun barrel at a sheet of perspex. The polystyrene keeps it concentric in the barrel and allows accurate speed measurement. The jelly bean fires at close to 300 miles an hour, straight into a plate of plexiglass a tenth of an inch thick. The jelly bean is soft and yet the plexiglass is instantly shattered because of the jelly bean's 289 miles per hour impact speed. It's easy to imagine how devastating a strike at that speed could be on the flesh and blood of a human being. Tornadoes kill or injure scores of people in the average year. Yet there is another weather phenomenon that takes a far higher toll: Flash flooding. Flash floods are usually caused by sudden torrential rain, causing rivers to burst their banks. And that's exactly what happened in Boscastle, England. The tiny village is popular with tourists captivated by its normally peaceful surroundings. Peace that is shattered by hours of torrential rain in the midsummer of 2004. Among the many motorists visiting the village that day are Richard and Rachel Strauss. This is one vacation they'll never forget. When they return to their car, they find that the street where they've parked is rapidly becoming a river. I don't think anybody realized quite how serious it was at that point. It was obvious the river had, had burst its banks, um, but I guess nobody thought that anything else was going to happen. Usually little more than a gentle flow, the river balancing millions of gallons of water over its banks. It races through the village, trapping unsuspecting motorists and passengers in their cars. Seeing the speed at which the water was rising, it struck me that something serious was, was, was about to happen. And there was this woman with, um, uh, her head was out of the sunroof of the car, and uh, she was screaming for help. Within minutes, the floods get deeper and deeper with growing strength. Soon, they're sweeping away anything in their path. All I could see was water rising. I could hear people screaming. And eventually, I saw cars starting to move as well. With astonishing bravery, Richard leaves his partner and wades into the swirling waters to try and pull the terrified tourist from her car. By now, the water threatens to wash both Richard and the car away, with the driver still trapped inside. I stayed with this other woman, who was the driver of the car. And uh, she was, I can only describe as frozen in shock. She was pale, she didn't want to move. And I just said, we need to go now. By now, 20 minutes have gone by. Rachel is sick with worry that Richard has been swept away. And that was the point at which I wanted him back. <laughs> um, and that was the moment when, uh, you know, just for that split second, I wondered if, if I'd see him. I didn't know where he was, I didn't know what he was doing. Finally, Richard manages to pull the woman trapped in the car to safety. By now, the main street of the village is virtually unrecognizable as a road. It turns into a swirling torrent, sweeping millions of gallons of water to the sea. Military rescue helicopters arrive on the scene. The flood causes millions of dollars of damage and reduces the once picturesque village to a sea of stinking mud and debris. Yet amazingly, no lives are lost. For the Strausses, a return to the village stirs traumatic memories. It's one thing to watch it on the television, it's quite another thing to actually come back. The Boss Castle disaster shows the power of flash floods. 
faced with such power, how long could somebody resist being swept away? To find out, we take our fearless guinea pig, Louise Brady, to a canoe run in Nottingham, England. We crash 6,500 gallons of water a second down on her. Before facing the flood, survival expert Chris Ball gives Louise advice that should save her from drowning. We've got the line suspended across. The water at the moment is reasonably shallow. We'll turn the gate on. And then you need to hold onto the pole. And the first thing you should feel go is your legs from underneath you. So the water's going to come gushing in my face? Yeah. As soon as the water comes gushing into your face, you've only got so long to hold onto the pole because otherwise you can't breathe. The little technique is to actually rotate around and then hold the pole behind you. You've got a flow of water going past your face and you end up with a big air pocket. The demonstration is dangerous. Louise must wear a crash helmet and life jacket. There is a lifeguard on the bank with a rope and another in a kayak further down the course in case she is knocked unconscious and washed away. At first, the water runs at little more than a trickle, but the current soon gets stronger and starts to buffet her around. Within minutes, water smashes so hard into Louise's legs that she can no longer stay on her feet. If she doesn't adopt the safety position soon, she could drown. Louise struggles to hold on, but the effort of fighting the water is making her arms ache unbearably. Finally, the force of the water is just too much for her tired limbs. Within seconds, the rescue team throws her a rope and hauls her out of the water. That was absolutely unbelievable. You know, the water has so much force, it's incredible. And your legs are almost taken from underneath you. And I held on for as long as I could, but because of the coldness of the water, um, and then just the sheer force, it just takes you. There was no getting away from it. I couldn't hold on any longer. This demonstration shows that humans can offer little resistance against the overwhelming power of a flash flood. Louise was safe in this controlled situation. Caught in a real flash flood, there would be no one to pull her to safety. And that's without the added risk of hitting submerged debris or being sucked under by the swirling water. Close to rivers, flash floods are potentially a deadly danger. But no less dangerous is another weather extreme. Naked Science next looks at how humans can survive the dangers of extreme cold. Humankind sometimes faces a tough job to survive the worst of nature's fury. The problem is that we are only truly comfortable within a relatively small temperature range. What some would see as a human design fault is inherited from our earliest ancestors. Human beings developed on the African plains where the temperature is about 82 degrees. And bodies are designed more to get rid of excess heat than they are to maintain heat in, in cold temperatures. So when the body is exposed to extreme cold, it has very few mechanisms to protect itself. To learn more about what simple mechanisms we do have, we put our volunteer Louise Brady through yet another body shock demonstration. This time, it's extreme cold. Louise is inside a 55 degrees Fahrenheit chamber. It's like a fall day in Virginia, but even at this temperature, a person without protection could suffer hypothermia. The technician stays warm by going in and out of the room, but trapped in the cold, Louise's body switches onto autopilot to protect itself, particularly the vital organs such as the heart and lungs. It's crucial that they're kept warm. If her core temperature drops by more than a few degrees, her most important organs stop functioning efficiently. But Louise does have defenses. First, the blood is redirected to the body core, away from the surface, and underneath the insulating layers of fat tissue. Five minutes in, and the body's second level of temperature protection kicks in. Louise shivers. The rapid vibration of her muscles creates heat, warming the blood, which transfers that heat to other parts of the body. 
body defenses may be protecting her organs, but Louise still isn't feeling any better. I'm feeling colder and colder. Finger ends extremely cold, I'm getting a little bit stiff. Um, almost feeling a little bit numb there on the ends of my fingers. But I feel as though the cold is working its way down to my legs and right through to my toes. Louise's body has yet another mechanism to keep warm. Goosebumps that forces her body hair to stand up on end. The idea is that the hair traps a layer of insulating air next to the skin. But because, like most humans, Louise hasn't much body hair, the effect is minimal. Well, the body doesn't have very good mechanisms to protect itself against cold. And what will happen is that the body temperature will start to drop. Once that happens, the chemical reactions that run our bodies start to run amok because the temperature is off and the speed of the reactions is off. And then the whole body just starts to go haywire. Conditions fall apart, and uh, that's when people start to die. Fifteen minutes in, we warned her it's going to get worse, much worse. It's time now to introduce the wind chill factor, and I'm told it's going to be really cold. <sighs> the wind machine blows a 22-mile-per-hour wind directly on Louise. That's calculated to produce a wind chill factor of 16 degrees. So while the actual temperature in the chamber is still 55, the cooling effect that Louise feels is equivalent to a mere 39 degrees. Caught in the wind flow, Louise feels the effects almost instantaneously. In fact, our ability to survive extreme cold is greatly influenced by the wind levels we encounter. Wind is a far more deadly killer than cold. We can tolerate very, very low temperatures if there's no wind because when the body is is generating heat, that heat can rest on the surface quite a bit longer if there's no wind blowing it away. Oh, that was so cold. Oh. Infrared images show that Louise's extremities are significantly colder than when she entered the chamber. Before is on the left, after on the right. My body's gone quite tense. The wind was so cold, it was making my eyes run, and my teeth started chattering, and I felt like all the hairs on my body were standing on end. <laughs> Very cold. Louise's core temperature oh. has dropped about a quarter of <laughs> a degree, you. but her skin temperature has dropped over 10 degrees. That's not life-threatening, and once in the warm, it will quickly return to normal. However, if Louise was outside with no protection, she would slowly succumb to hypothermia. If her core temperature were to drop below 92 degrees, she could die. Extreme cold can kill as easily as extreme heat, which, in Dr. Kamler's opinion, is the worst way to die. If you're going to die from extreme heat or extreme cold, it might be better to die from extreme cold, since as your body temperature drops, your brain functions slow down, and uh, you become less aware of your environment, and people even report having a warm feeling at that point, and uh, maybe that's a more comfortable way to go. Extreme cold can be a slow death, but other extreme weather brings destruction in an instant. And Val Castor is a storm chaser. He was driving through a storm when hailstones started to fall on his truck. But these weren't just regular-sized stones. We all of a sudden started getting baseball-sized hail falling, you know, out of a place where it shouldn't have been falling at. And we tried to run from it, and it caught us, and we never got out of it. Oh, man! Val's truck was pounded by hundreds of giant hailstones. my truck. Broke out the windows, broke out the headlights, the blinkers, the taillights, knocked off the antennas, um, shattered the windshield so bad that we couldn't even see out of it. We had glass coming in on us. Matter of fact, I probably had a dozen little cuts in my arm um, just from the glass coming in from the windshield. The speed hailstones fall is determined by gravity, their size, and wind conditions. A free-falling one-inch diameter natural hailstone would be traveling around 45 miles an hour when it hits the ground. A three-inch stone, around 85 miles an hour. Are you all right? Oh, I'm fine, yeah. You got some few bruises? Yeah, yeah. Ouch. Was that what 
What size was it? I don't know. You know, I've been hit before with a golf ball size hailstone on the head. And maybe that's why I'm so crazy right now. But just what sort of damage can a hailstone really do on impact? We went back to Dr. Roger White at Kinetic. As part of his research, he studies the impact of ice on jet engines. To do this, he fires ice bullets of different sizes from his compressed gas gun. The gun has a 60-foot barrel and can fire a range of projectiles at speeds up to 900 miles an hour. That's faster than the speed of sound. Dr. White creates a styrofoam capsule to hold the hailstone in the gun barrel. This is to ensure that the irregular shape manufactured hailstones are all accelerated to the correct speed. The, the gun bores are not normally the same diameter as the, the hailstones, etc., that we fire. Um, to make them, to hold them concentrically in the barrel whilst we're launching them, we put them into a thing called a sabo, which is effectively a, a cup. For low velocity shots, the styrofoam cup is strong enough to support the hailstone. But if he wants to fire them at higher velocities, he has to place the styrofoam cup into an aluminum holder, or it will disintegrate under the pressure of the compressed gas. To accurately measure the speed of the ice bullets, there are two infrared sensors that calculate the velocity to within six feet a second. First, he fires a three-inch hailstone at 105 miles per hour at the window of a car. It shatters instantly. But what would happen if it hit a human being? As it is much too dangerous to shoot at a person, Dr. White fires different sized hailstones at some fruit and vegetables. In each case, the hailstone is fired at the speed it would naturally reach were it falling to earth in a storm. This is what happens when a one inch hailstone traveling at 55 miles per hour hits an apple. And a sheet of plexiglass. And a three inch stone hitting a pumpkin and a life-size human fiberglass dummy. These are just laboratory demonstrations. Had the three-inch hailstones made a direct hit on a person out in the field, they could have resulted in death. Storms that spawn hailstones can be dangerous on land. At sea, those same storms can be deadly. One man who faced nature's fury and survived is round-the-world yachtsman Tony Bullimore. It's January 1997. Bullimore is taking part in the Bombay Road single-handed round-the-world yachts. Between Australia and Antarctica, the ultimate disaster strikes. Bullimore's boat is hit by a massive storm and gale force winds. Notice the very black sliver coming over the horizon from the south. Uh, which in fact was a, a massive weather park that was going to come down on me. Then all of a sudden there was an almighty crack. And the boat instantly, within a couple of seconds, had, had capsized. Bullimore is still inside his craft, now wallowing upside down and buffeted by giant waves. And then the water came in like the Niagara Falls upside down, and within a couple of minutes the boat was completely full of water other than an air pocket which was probably about 18 inches. Now I'm standing in the water uh, and my body is starting to get numb and I realized that I had to put my survival suit on quickly otherwise I'd have a massive problem of hypothermia and frostbite and big problems. Bullimore manages to put on his state-of-the-art immersion suit designed to maintain his core body temperature. Without it, he has no chance of survival. Water temperature is probably 40 degrees. That's about the temperature off Maine in January. Tony pulls himself out of the water and perches on a ledge. He knows he's in serious trouble. Uh, I'm 1,500 miles from Australia. I'm in the middle of a raging storm. Um, where do I go from here? Uh, I'm not on the shipping lane, so I don't think I can rely on any ships coming to my assistance. Uh, and if the storm carried on, you know, I think it would have taken the boat and me to the bottom. I started to think about my wife and family and what I was leaving, uh, you know, what I was leaving behind. 
Then I thought, maybe tomorrow or the day after, I'll be gone. Five days after capsizing, the upturned boat is reached by an Australian Navy frigate. Sailors from the frigate take a small boat to the capsized yacht and bang on the side to see if anyone is still alive. Hearing the raps on the upturned hull, Bullimore dives into the near-freezing water and swims out from under the hull. It was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I was facing the right way, and uh, the Royal Australian uh, Naval Frigate uh, was probably a couple of hundred meters in one of the... I thought, God, you know, a big grin come over me say, face, I've been saved. A major factor in Bullimore's survival was his state-of-the-art cold water immersion suit. How might he have fared without it? To learn what happens to our bodies when we're plunged unprotected into icy water, volunteer Louise Brady faces the last of our body shock demonstrations, extreme cold water. Before going into the cold water, her dexterity and strength are tested to see how the ordeal will affect her ability to do simple tasks. We're going to look at your muscle strength, both before and after you've been in the chambers. And to do this, we're using this hand grip dynamometer. OK, and stop there. Lovely. 38.3 kilograms. To test her nimbleness, she must do a simple dexterity test called the O'Connor test. It will test her fine motor skills, the sort of tasks that could save her life in an emergency. She records an excellent time of one minute and eight seconds. To ensure Louise's safety, she wears a life jacket and her temperature is monitored at all times. The water is set at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the October temperature of the sea off Maine. It's also the same temperature as the air in the cold chamber, but the effects are very different. Immediately as Louise enters the water, she goes into shock. The effect of the sudden cold water against her body sets off a reflex action of gasping for breath. Oh, oh, I'm extremely cold, almost taking my breath away. Oh. But this reflex action can have a catastrophic effect, as the gasping for air can cause people to swallow water and even drown. The body has a natural instinct to take in oxygen when it finds itself in a survival situation. People who suddenly and unexpectedly find themselves immersed in water run a very high risk of drowning. But yet opening your mouth underwater is the last thing you want to do. If you're able to control that instinct and not take a breath, you then have to sort of fight your way out of the water. So if the water is the same 55 degrees as the cold chamber Louise has already endured, why is it so much more deadly? The answer is that water transports heat away from the body 25 times faster than cold air does. So if you're in contact with cold water, that water is going to literally suck the heat out of your body. It was this dramatic heat loss in icy water that caused the appalling loss of life in one of the worst maritime disasters of all time, the sinking of the Titanic. Those who were in the lifeboats survived because they were only exposed to cold air. By contrast, all but 10 of the people in the water died even though the water temperature was nearly the same as the air temperature. They died because the cold water began sucking heat from their bodies more efficiently than the air, and they fell victim to hypothermia. Louise's chilly bath is not as cold as that, but it still causes her major problems. Not such a shock as what it was when I first got in, because it really took my breath away. I'm breathing, um... A little bit better. I'm not so frightened. I can see how people only survive the minutes when they've gone overboard. It's very frightening. Louise's blood supply is being redirected to the center of her body to protect vital organs. The effect of redirecting the heat away from her extremities is giving Louise some odd sensations. Even though she is cooling down, her brain tricks her into thinking the opposite. I don't know, I feel very strange now. I almost feel like I'm tingling as if I'm warming up in a funny kind of way. As less blood flows into her limbs, they begin to go numb. I can't 
can't feel my feet now. At all. <laughs> my brain is telling me that if I move, I'll... If, my, if I move my limbs, I'll, I'll stay warm. But that is the worst thing she can do. The exertion would force vital heat into her limbs, allowing it to be sucked out into the water as her arms and legs act like radiators. So far from keeping her warm, swimming around would actually make Louise colder. My teeth are really starting to chatter, and my body's going quite tense. And my hands and wrists are numb, and my feet and my ankles are really numb. My core has gone really quite tense and stiff. Part of my body is wanting to slow it down. After just 20 minutes in the water, her core temperature has dropped nearly a degree to 98.8. I don't really want to talk or do anything much, really, um, apart from get warm. The rate of heat loss varies widely from person to person. But if Louise's core cooled below 82 degrees, then she could become unconscious. Below 78 degrees, she could die. Amazingly, because blood from her extremities is still very cold, Louise's core body temperature continues to drop, even though she's out of the water. I think I'm feeling worse now than what I did when I was in there. I'm really cold and really numb, and I feel really stiff everywhere. I can't really feel my feet and the bottom half of my legs very much. A retake of the strength and dexterity tests is revealing. Her strength has dropped by a third. And Louise also takes almost twice as long to fit in all the pegs. This is because the cold has slowed down chemical reactions in her brain and muscles. Her brain is working less efficiently, and her muscles won't allow her to control the finer motor movements of her hands. Had she been at sea, she may not have been able to open a life raft or fire a flare. Perhaps the difference between life and death. Once in a warm bath, Louise's temperature starts to rise. I've never ever felt as cold as that, ever. I can easily see now when people get that cold, how they just don't want to move, they don't want to think, and they just, they can't see an end to being that cold. They just give up the will to live. Louise was only in the cold water for 20 minutes. At sea, she could have died within hours. We've seen nature's fuel in the world. The extraordinary destructive power of tornado winds. How hard it is to survive a flash flood or a lightning strike. What happens to our bodies when we're subjected to extreme heat, cold, and cold water? But the question still remains. Why ultimately do some people survive? We are all roughly the same when it comes to physiology. So what is it about some individuals that keeps them alive? The answer, in many cases, comes down to the most fragile part of our body, our brain. Humankind uses intellect and ingenuity to develop ways of surviving most extreme weather. We build shelters, create survival aids, and make protective clothing. We develop technologies to warn us of impending deadly weather. But what about those who are caught in potentially lethal weather? How do they survive against the odds? It turns out that many are sustained by another important attribute of our brains, our willpower. The mental aspect of survival is really critical. The people who are successful at surviving extreme conditions are the ones who generally have a larger goal in mind. Almost all survivors will tell you that they did have some higher reason to survive. They're trying to save themselves for the sake of their family, for, uh, for religion, for duty, for honor, for some greater purpose. So the bottom line is, the greater your willpower, the greater your desire to live, the greater your chances of surviving nature's fury.